Galapagos has always been famous in evolutionary terms for its terrestrial life. Maybe we're sort of at a threshold now where Galapagos will be on the map among marine biologists just as much as it's on the map among terrestrial biologists. What I'm really hoping is that, you know, 50 years from now, people will take a look at this expedition and sort of chuckle and say, man, can you imagine how did those people live back then? What primitive conditions, you know? They didn't know, they were doing the best they could, but they didn't quite have a, much of a grasp on things. Now, that'd be great. Scientists use the phrase introduced species to describe newcomers that upset the ecology of a pristine place. Ecologically, no species is more upsetting than human beings. After people arrive, even well-behaved, respectful people like most of the tourists who come here, things can never be the same. There are now daily jet flights to the Galapagos. The trip from South America takes only an hour and 20 minutes. The Galapagos are part of Ecuador. The Ecuadorian government regulates the flow of tourists who generally come here to admire the island's fragile beauty, not to disrupt it. The money they spend is very welcome in an underdeveloped country. To an extent, this flow of revenue works in favor of preserving the natural wonders of the islands because tourists would simply not come here if the islands were spoiled. Nevertheless, people leave their mark. Even in a place seemingly as remote as Galapagos, I mean, there are more than 50,000 tourists a year coming, coming out here. So. Uh, the beach we're sitting on, boy, what a wonderful beach. It looks great. And within a 50-foot radius of us here, you know, you could pick up a 1,000 pieces of garbage. Now, garbage in itself maybe doesn't cause extinction, but nevertheless, it represents a type of human impact. Like, now there are fire ants on Española Island. It's the only significant nesting colony of the waved albatross. What's it like to be a little chick of a waved albatross or a big fat chick of a waved albatross fighting fire ant bites? all the time. What if a little red ant like a fire ant causes the loss of this entire species? Fire ants that came on shore with someone's food or on someone's clothes. We need to tread lightly on these sorts of places. This is Academy Bay, one of three areas where the 15,000 residents of the Galapagos are allowed to live. To go elsewhere, even for scientific research, requires numerous permissions from government and conservation agencies. Galapagos is considered one of the world's most protected natural habitats. Ecuador wants to keep it that way, on land and in its waters, within 15 miles offshore. But enforcement is difficult. The Discovery Expedition, exploring one day in rich, protected waters, encountered a fishing boat clearly violating the 15-mile limit. They're working, and there is, a, there is another fishing boat farther out. Yeah, their nets are down there. Juan Carlos Noranjo, the National Park Service guide assigned to the Discovery Expedition, is reporting the illegal fishing to Ecuadorian authorities. Habíamos quedado en standby the problem right now is that um, these people is fishing right into the uh, park waters they're only about two and a half miles away from roca redonda and uh, we already have reported them to the uh, port captain on santa cruz they will probably come and get them if they are able to uh, capture them what they will do is keep the boats and uh, they will have to pay to be able to get their boats back. 
The ship flies no flag. Juan Carlos says most violators are Costa Rican, Venezuelan, or Ecuadorian. By radio, the boat's captain refuses to identify himself and rebuffs Juan Carlos with insults. Then, stalling for time while the boat pulls up its nets, he insists that he has special permission for tuna fishing. Then, he promises to stop immediately. His name is Capitan Fernandez, and they are working on selective fishing of tuna, which uh, is hard to believe. You mean, since we've been at sea, they changed all the rules in Ecuador? In two days, by the radio. Days. By radio. This yeah. is how decisions it's are what, made? It's what uh, he says. I mean, I don't yeah. believe these guys. for sure. Either. Ecuador is smarter than that to sell out the National yeah. Park in two days and in two allow days. him on the radio to go out and start fishing exactly. in the National Park. That would be like allowing a... Yeah, commercial basically. elk hunting project to take off in the Yellowstone National Park by radio. Exactly. No, no, uh, by radio things don't work. Ecuador is smarter uh, than this. What worries me is the big ships that we saw over there farther out. So they're fishing in the National Park, delivering it to the mothership. He said, we Ecuadorians are allowed to come in. We're not foreigners, but we're talking about motherships. We're talking about tons of fish going out of Galapagos. You think this goes on every day? In the National Park. Is this an everyday occurrence? In Unfortunately, Africa? yes. Uh, we need to work on the conscience of the people here. And uh, unfortunately, there is no common sense on the importance of, of conservation. The discovery vessel departed before authorities arrived. Unofficial word said the fishing boat had been confiscated temporarily and fined but its catch had shown up in Galapagos seafood markets. There was no reason to think illegal fishing was more than briefly discouraged. While tourism and illegal fishing are relatively new threats, the greatest damage to Galapagos over the years has been inflicted by animals or introduced species that people brought to the islands, dogs and cats, farm animals like cattle, goats, donkeys, horses, pigs, and also rats that stowed away aboard ships. When they get on islands, they're just cut loose. There's virtually no check on their populations, so their numbers grow rapidly, and they have devastating effects on the vegetation. They also have a devastating effect on animal populations. Stedman visited the Darwin Research Station, where baby animals are safely nurtured till they're ready to survive on their own. These are three-year-old tortoises from the island of Santiago. Uh, Santiago is an island that has a lot of problems with introduced species. And so even though there's a wild population of tortoises there that in fact can lay eggs in the wild, the eggs are eaten especially by rats and pigs. So wardens from the National Park and from the Darwin Station dig up these eggs as soon as they're laid, bring them to the Darwin Station to be incubated here, and then they raise them here until they're four or five years old. This tortoise here is about three years old now, so it has a year or two to go before it can be let go back on Santiago. By one year old, these tortoises are, are sort of rat proof. So a rat can't hurt a tortoise after it's about a year old. But on Santiago, with the, all the feral pigs they have, they have thousands of feral pigs on Santiago. The tortoises, these poor little baby tortoises, need to be about four or five years old before they're pig proof. So this is a good example of very active hands-on manipulation of a wild population in order to keep it going without the Darwin Station and the National Park working every day with these little tortoises the tortoises wouldn't survive so while maybe the funding comes more from countries outside of Ecuador it's Ecuadorians working hands-on as well as conceptually designing these programs that really make these programs work The Galapagos evolved in isolation, and isolation was their only protection. Now, that isolation has ended. It's a paradox that everything that makes the islands attractive seems to put them in jeopardy. Their remote solitude draws visitors by the thousands, 
Their unspoiled beauty is a magnet for tourism and commerce. Their natural abundance creates a virtual feast for introduced animal predators and human exploiters. The question is whether these humble creatures and their vulnerable ecology can withstand the human response to their unique appeal. Whether they can survive the most traumatic of evolutionary events, the arrival of people. Galapagos is really famous for how tame the animals are. This tameness in Galapagos animals has evolved because the species that live out here have evolved in the absence of mammalian predators. So these animals have virtually no predator response. So this tameness is an island adaptation. It doesn't occur to these species that we're something that might kill it. Nature is efficient. If fear isn't needed, it fades away. Animals become tame. But evolution lacks foresight. It failed to anticipate the coming of humans. Early sailors in the islands took cruel delight in the vulnerability and innocence of Galapagos animals. Killing them was so easy. Charles Darwin never used the phrase survival of the fittest, but evolutionary adaptations do tend to make species better at surviving, usually by creating specialties. The specialty gives them competitive advantage or allows them to move into a niche where less competition exists. For instance, instead of competing with other gulls in daytime feeding, the swallow-tailed gull became a specialist in feeding at night. The swallow-tailed gull is unusual among gulls in that it has a very much enlarged eye, which is a beautiful adaptation for feeding nocturnally. The swallow-tailed gull feeds mainly on bioluminescent type organisms that light up the surface of the sea at night. The red eye ring is another adaptation for functioning nocturnally. The most famous Galapagos adaptation story, a classroom cliche for many years, involves the finches. A single finch species arrived in the islands, but later generations developed beaks specialized to fill different feeding niches. For example, there were no woodpeckers in Galapagos, so one finch developed a woodpecker-like beak. Others became cactus eaters, tick eaters, vegetarians, blood suckers, tool users. 13 finch species, 13 different beaks. A parallel to the finch's beaks turned up one day when the discovery expedition captured these two hawkfish. The short snout is better for picking food off the surface of rocks or coral. The long snout is an adaptation for reaching into crevices. Maybe the best-known Galapagos adapter is the marine iguana. According to common thinking, it arrived in Galapagos as a land iguana. Food for land creatures was scarce, but the Galapagos seashore offered abundant feeding. Over millions of years, some of the land iguanas ventured into the water. Individuals with better tails for swimming and shorter snouts for eating had a competitive advantage they could become divers for algae. Over millions of years, the advantages that made them divers were accentuated until the marine iguana separated from the land iguana and became a new species. This process Darwin called natural selection, nature selecting modifications. An iguana originally designed for land being redesigned for water. Because the ocean is cold in Galapagos, the marine iguanas lose a lot of heat when they go out to graze on algae underwater. So the marine iguanas that you see lined up here are aligning themselves to maximize the solar radiation that they soak up so that they can warm up again. A lot of times you'll see marine iguanas shoot a salt spray out of their nostrils. It seems a little rude, 
but they do that regularly